Since ancient times, people have known about hereditary traits and have manipulated them in animal husbandry and agriculture. But even through the 1800s, when Darwin was theorizing about evolution, very little was known about the source of hereditary information or how that information passed from one organism to its progeny. In the mid-20th century, that source was found, and biology took a giant step forward. In 1953, Francis Crick and James Watson published an article in the journal Nature that for the first time described the structure of the molecule that determines heredity. Relying heavily on the work of chemist Rosalind Franklin, Crick and Watson proposed a model that would earn them a Nobel Prize and open the door to understanding how the molecule operates. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is a molecule composed of two long chains of smaller molecules. These two strands are twisted in a pattern called a double helix. The molecules that make up each chain are called nucleotides. Each nucleotide is made up of a phosphate, a sugar, and one of four bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. The two chains are held together by bonds formed between complementary bases. Adenine will always pair with thymine and cytosine with guanine. The order of these pairs down the chain results in a code that controls protein production and thereby determines cellular function. Since the discovery of this structure in the early 1950s, scientists have learned a great deal about how this molecule can be used. Genetic engineering has been used to recombine the DNA of plants to improve crops and bacteria to produce medicine. DNA fingerprinting can identify someone or determine relationships between individuals and infections can be diagnosed when the DNA of a pathogenic microorganism is found in a patient. The first step for any of these uses is the extraction of DNA from within the cell membrane, but despite its fibrous appearance, DNA is stiff and brittle. To avoid damaging the molecule, we need a method that will break down the cell around it. Fortunately, DNA extraction can be done relatively inexpensively with a minimum of laboratory equipment. E. coli cells are commonly used to demonstrate this process, as they can be easily obtained and frozen for long-term storage. To grow a culture of these cells, a nutrient-enriched medium must first be prepared. Stir 5 grams of peptone and 3 grams of meat extract into a liter of distilled water. Using hydrochloric acid or sodium hydroxide, adjust the pH balance to 7. Pipette 4 milliliters of the broth into some 15 milliliter culture tubes. Cap them and bring them to an autoclave to be sterilized. To prepare the cells, suspend a two to three millimeter mass of E. coli in each sterilized culture tube. Aseptic techniques prevent contamination of the sample. Incubate the tubes overnight at 37 degrees Celsius to allow the cells to reproduce. Add five grams of detergent to each tube and shake. Cell membranes are made of two layers of lipid molecules. Just as detergent bonds with grease on a dishpan, the detergent molecules bond with the fats of the cells, breaking them down. To isolate the DNA, place the tubes into a water bath at 65 to 75 degrees Celsius. Raising the temperature above 60 degrees will destroy the enzymes and leave the DNA. But be careful not to let the bath get too hot. DNA breaks apart at 80 degrees. Carefully layer 3 milliliters of 95% ethanol on top of the solution. DNA is alcohol insoluble, so it will appear in the ethanol as a white, web-like mass called precipitate. To speed up precipitation, gently push a stirring rod into the solution, stir, and turn. Alcohol is pushed into the cell soup 
and each time a little more DNA appears. Continue stirring, but don't mix the layers completely. Just as the isolation of DNA as the molecule of heredity opened the door to a new field of science, DNA extraction is the threshold to some of the most exciting scientific work being done today.